Welcome to Abiding Presence Lutheran Church, a place of grace. All are welcome. Our mission here is to seek God and serve others. Happy Fourth of July. I hope you have found a safe way to celebrate our nation's independence. A few announcements for you. We are anticipating the arrival of our intern, Stephen Swanson, in the weeks to come. Please keep him and his uh, community in your prayers. Also, another announcement for you is that we were set to open the church up for in-person worship on July 11th and 12th, and the council has met and decided that that is not a good idea. We want you to stay home. We want you to stay safe. It was also the decision that for the remainder of July, the church will be closed for in-person worship and activities, and we will not open until we've seen a two-week period of declines in COVID cases uh, where we can all gather together safely. So until then, let's continue our worship service with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. You are great, O God, and greatly to be praised. You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Grant that we may believe in you, call upon you, know you, and serve you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We now continue with the first reading, a reading from Zechariah, chapter 9. Beginning at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious as he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. He will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, that is, in my flesh. I can will what is right but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, 
But I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from his, this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Hi kids, I hope you're doing well. I've been thinking about you lately, wondering how you're doing with all this stuff going on in the world. I'm going to show you with you how I keep my life sort of organized. I keep it put together in this folder. This folder has the important things in my life. First, it has a little burnt orange and white sticker in the front to remind me of Kirby Mask, who's a friend of mine. Inside is all the important things. Uh, here's today's sermon. Today's worship service is in here. Here's a calendar that reminds me I was supposed to pick up cupcakes at 1 o'clock, and I have them. I always write with a pen like this. When I was a kid, this pen cost 19 cents. Uh, we were poor, and only the rich kids had 25 cent pens. Mine was 19 cents. And sometimes if I get my head gets too big, I like to pull out this pen because it reminds me where I came from. I came from humble roots, and I need to remember that. But also in here is this little piece of paper. <clears throat> This little piece of paper is about, I don't know if you can see it, it's about 25 years old, maybe 28 years old. And my daughter gave this to me when she was about your age. And she wrote the word love on it with an exclamation point. And one day when I woke up, it was right there on my pillow. And I always carry that with me. And I have other little notes that she wrote me when she was younger. In a few minutes, I'll be reading the gospel lesson to you. And the gospel lesson talks about people coming to us with their, with their worries in life, their concerns, their times they're upset. And Jesus says, come to me, you who are worried about life, and I'll, I'll give you a sense of rest. I'll listen to you. Sometimes the greatest gift you can give somebody is your time. Whether you write mom and dad a little note like this and leave it on their pillow, Maybe if they take a lunch to work, you write it down and you put that little note in their lunch and they open up their lunch and there's this wonderful surprise. But sometimes the best gift you can give somebody is your time. Whether it's calling your grandma or grandpa if you have one, spending time with mom or dad, spending time with your brother and sister, just quietness and just listening to them. Sometimes at Father's Day, my kids always say, Dad, what do you want? You know what I want? I just want time. I want time with my kids, with my four incredible grandsons. God gives us so many gifts, and the one gift you can give to your friends and your family is time. I hope that you can find some time during this week to spend with those who are closest to you. We'll see you all later. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus spoke to the crowd, saying, To what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Look, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, 
for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Another way that can be translated from the Greek is, come to me, you who are emotionally exhausted. Those of you who are physically drained, who are carrying the problems of life, carrying a lifetime of shame and guilt and pain and hurt, and I will provide a space of quietness, a sanctuary, a place to reflect and to be refreshed, a place once again to breathe in the breath of God, to be one with God. I've never been a fan of reading fiction. I've always said flippantly I don't read fiction because it's not true, but in fairness to me, I really could not read until a fifth grade or so. But I remember being in something like sixth grade, my mother and I went to the library at the base, and I checked out the book, The Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire. The librarian tried to redirect me to the children's section. My mother said, simply humor me. I took the book home, read about three words, got totally lost. But the one book of fiction that I read that really teach, touched me deeply is Carl Sagan's book, Contact. First I saw the movie and then I read the book. Carl Sagan considered himself an atheist, but as I considered the closing section of his book, to me, Contact is almost a theological masterpiece. And so I've said over the years that I jokingly say that Carl Sagan is one of the more significant theologians of the 20th century. A very, very brief summary of the book or the movie. Dr. Arroway is the, is the main character. She's a scientist. She's an agnostic. It really means that her, she does not understand the world through the eyes of religious language or through the ears of religious language. But she goes on some sort of life-changing journey through outer space, and she comes home, and she, well, she experiences something really remarkable. She comes home, and she's being questioned about this extraordinary experience. More accurately, she's being grilled over her experience. And the person grilling her says, why don't you just admit what, by your own standards, must be the truth? that this experience simply did not happen. And she responds so beautifully. She says, I had an experience. I can't prove it. I can't even explain it. All I can tell you is that everything I know as a human being, everything that I am tells me it was real. I was giving something wonderful, something that changed me, a vision of the universe that made it overwhelmingly clear just how tiny and insignificant, and yet at the same time how rare and precious we all are. A vision that tells us we belong to something greater than ourselves, that we are not, that none of us is alone. In the closing dialogue of the book, Dr. Arroway remembers something her father said. And he said, after all the suffering, after all the desolation of the void, the one thing that makes the vastness tolerable is each other. The one thing that makes it bearable is love. You and I belong to something greater than ourselves, and you and I are not alone. In the language of Matthew's gospel, come to me, you who are emotionally exhausted. Those of you who are physically drained, who are carrying the problems of life, generations of anger, who find yourselves isolated and alone, carrying a lifetime of shame and guilt, of pain and hurt, 
and I will provide a space of quietness to reflect and to be refreshed, a place to once again breathe in the breath of God. I will help you carry the burdens of life. This breath of God is one of my favorite images from Genesis. As I read that passage and I play it in my mind, I see God's hand on the chest of Adam, putting his mouth on Adam's and gently blowing life into something lifeless. And I think that's part of the role of religion, especially in today's world, to breathe life into the lifeless, to restore hope to those who've lost hope. To have this profound understanding that as we stare out into space or we stare into the abyss of life, how small and insignificant we are, but also how rare and precious each of us is, and that we are not alone. Sometimes in church we get distracted by meaningful conversations about larger things. We argue transubstantiation and consubstantiation with the Roman Catholics. We argue if the pyramid should be purple or blue for Advent. We argue about bread types. Is the bread uh, unleavened bread or is just store-bought bread? We wonder if the wine is appropriate for communion or not. But I wonder if the kingdom of heaven isn't really experienced in the quieter times of life, in those smaller conversations, when one person sits with another, and one person's joys and celebrations, burdens and sorrows are shared with another. And that's kind of what I was alluding to last week. There are those carrying a lot of anger and frustration. Some of it is, is generations long. To those who are going through these times, come to me, you who are emotionally drained, those who have been physically abused, those who are carrying the weight of life, carrying a lifetime of guilt and pain and hurt. And I will provide a sanctuary, a place to reflect, a place to be refreshed. If I could rewrite the words of Carl Sagan's uh, novel specifically to the church, we have had an experience. We can't prove it. We can't even explain it. All we can say is that everything we know as human beings, everything we are, tells us that it is real. In Jesus of Nazareth, we are giving something wonderful, something that changed us, a vision of life that made it overwhelmingly clear just how rare and precious we all are, each of us created in God's image. A vision that tells us we belong to something greater than ourselves, that we're not, none of us is alone. In times of sadness and overwhelming grief, come to me. In the isolation we're in now and the uncertainty of tomorrow, I will give you rest. I will listen to your shame and your guilt and I will give you acceptance. I will offer to you the forgiveness of Christ who has forgiven me. A hymn that has offered comfort to generations, for generations, has been taken to the Lord in prayer. It's a wonderful song. The problems of life would take it to God in prayer. But you, you are the abiding presence of Christ. You, the church, are the body of Christ. You are the eyes and ears of Christ. You are the hands, and you are Christ's voice. And that charge is given to each of you. Come to me, you who are emotionally exhausted. Those of you who are just physically drained, who are carrying the problems of lifetimes, carrying lifetimes of shame and guilt and pain and hurt, come to me. I will provide a space of quietness, a sanctuary, a place to reflect, a place to be refreshed a place once again to breathe in the breath of God, to be one with God, and to feel for just a moment that you are not alone.
let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for, for our shared world. We pray for the church around the globe, where Christians are assembling for worship. Protect them from viral infection. Strengthen, strengthen those believers who doubt your goodness. Bless pastors, deacons, and church staff as they serve our congregations in this difficult time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the well-being of creation. Grant renewal to the air, the waters, and the lands. Save the animals whose natural habitats are being threatened by climate change or human carelessness, and direct us towards sustainable living. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the nations. Keep the world from war. Pave the way for just elections. Uphold our courts. Guide our national and state governments in finding ways to redress the wrongs of racism and ensure equality for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are sick and suffering. Console the fearful, feed the hungry, house the homeless, shelter the runaways, heal the many who are affected by the coronavirus, and guide researchers in discovering a vaccine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for infants and young children, that they may be carefully tended. We pray for teens, that they keep patience throughout the contagion. We pray for the school boards, that they find solutions for this upcoming school year. We pray for the unemployed, that they may find jobs. We pray for medical workers, that they remain healthy. We pray for the aged, especially those in care facilities, that they find companionship in your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray finally for ourselves. Show us that the yoke of faith is easy. May we find our rest in you. Hear now our private petitions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give thanks for those who have died in faith. Comfort all who mourn their dead, and at the end bring us and all your people into eternal rest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a sign of peace with those around you. Text someone right now. Peace be with you, Mike. Peace be with peace you. Peace be with you. Abiding Presence Lutheran Church is here to breathe life into the lifeless, to bring hope into the hopeless. And we are not alone. We belong to something greater than ourselves. And together, we are bringing the kingdom of God to a hurting world, to seek God and to serve others. Thank you for being a part of this congregation and for your continued generosity.
Let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Your word is a light for our path. Nourish us through this gift that we might proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. We continue with the thanksgiving for the word. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from chaos, and brought forth life into being. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water in the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness. Forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. Send your spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of the world in need. Faithful to your word, draw near to all who call on you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Be at peace. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God.